Welcome to Uncomfortable, conversations about culture and Christianity. My name is Eric, and today I am joined by Jess. Hello, my friends. Uh, that that felt <laughs> different. Uh, and Alex. What, what happened, Jess? <laughs> what happened? That is not how this thing goes. You just, Do you want to start over? No, I mean, I know, it's already can, happened. Did We're you just make the decision to forever change? Okay, this is how I was thinking. Like, I said, hello, world. And, like, I've gotten to know everybody over the past year. We okay. kind of took a break. We're coming back. And I feel like everybody's my friend now. Hmm. So I'm just bringing it a little closer to home is what I thought. Okay. But I, you guys were a little thrown off. I, I still, I just, I don't know. Catchphrases are something that stick with people. Okay. And I feel like maybe they just. Then or lack of like catchphrases. It. I just yeah. refuse to have a catchphrase on the podcast. Um, okay. Yeah. I have one in life. He's been Hello. trying them out all for like years yeah. now and he just hasn't quite found one that works. I, well, my They're catchphrase gonna, People is, are going to listen and think you guys are bullying me. Yeah, that's into, true. Back into it, so. Your Eat. catchphrase is more of an outro. Yeah, it's more of an outro like than an intro. Like a goodbye, a yeah. salutation. Okay. Yeah. Well, so I, that's why hello I'm world. The there we go. <laughs> All is better, better now? with the world now. <laughs> okay. What, There's so much else changing around us that I, I can't true. take that okay. changing right now. That's true. If you're you needed wa- a little comfort. If you're watching this, which, I mean, I, I don't know. We don't really, I guess we don't know for sure how many people watch versus how many mm-hmm. uh, listen. But if you're watching this, we have moved. That was part of the reason we took a break. Uh, which is a good thing. Uh, city Care, it, where we we were in part of that same building as City mm-hmm. Care Counseling. They're growing. They're expanding. Uh, growing can, and expanding. They're adding seven new offices, so they're going to be able to sign seven more counselors to contracts over in that building. Awesome. Yeah. So and then that meant we have a new space. Mm-hmm. But don't worry, the neon came with us. It did it was a process? Uh huh. You don't just move neon. No. Uh, the I don't neon, even know. Neon's what that kind took. of a permanent home thing, you know. And mm-hmm. so yeah, it took a little effort. I'm gonna give you guys some credit because I didn't really help so much with the move, but Alex, you did a lot. Well, Eric, Eric I Eric think you did, did a lot, lot as well. too. And Austin. And Austin. Shout out to Austin, who's amazing behind the scenes. But mm-hmm. I did not not help, but I supported. You did. You <laughs> as much as I could. supported us. Yes, I did. Uh-huh. That's good. All right. So, what's uh, what did everyone do? Our time away. We were gone. Did anything exciting happen? We should probably catch up with each other a little bit. We haven't talked to each other in five <laughs> weeks or Forever. four weeks or whatever it's been. At least not on camera. No, not at all. We just haven't. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. Uh, anything. I I took a vacation. You I, did. I did. Uh, last year was my well. Yeah, July 1st of 2020 was my 20th wedding anniversary. And, you know, we'd been saving our nickels and dimes for a a nice, because we never went on a honeymoon or anything like that. We're like, let's do this for real. And then, of course, COVID. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that kind of put a damper on that plan. So we thought, well, what if we, you know, saved up for another year, did kind of a big family thing, you know, for 2021. And we ended up going to Hawaii for the first time. Experiencing that. And yeah, it was a, it was a lot of fun. And um, I don't know if it has this effect on everyone, but I kind of didn't want to come back. Mm. So what would you say was your highlight? Oh, there was one night that we went snorkeling with manta rays, which was pretty cool. And they get so close to you, and you get to watch them eat plankton and stuff, so it was pretty fun. That's really fun. You got yeah. to share it with your wife and your kids. Yeah. Yeah, I think we all had a good time, and my uh, my wife and my daughter are convinced that we are moving to Hawaii, so I, <laughs> if anybody's a real estate agent, let me know. And start saving your uh-huh. pennies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's... Uh, one of the things that I'm sometimes jealous of is that you have kids that are at that age, you know, like I'm at, we went to Colorado this year for our vacation, but it's probably, you're in the stage where your vacations are, are kind of maybe at least vacations. Like for my wife and I, our vacations are still like babysitting at the same time. Yeah. Doing the same thing in a different place. Yeah. (laughs) And so we went to Colorado, (laughs) which is fun because it, the, half the joy is seeing the wonder of your kids' faces and things like that. So we went up to Estes for a couple days. Um, there's no AC usually up there, and so one of the nights was probably top three worst nights of my life because none of my kids <laughs> oh, would no. sleep. Oh, oh no. no! I mean, it was so hot in there. 
and there was like musical beds. There were two bunk beds in one room plus us, and there's not really anywhere to escape once your kids go to bed, but they didn't that night anyway. And so um, it was a rough, sweaty night, uh, mm. but the Lord uh, came through the next day with mm. nicer uh, weather. That's good. And we made it made it through that, and then we went up northern Colorado for a couple days after that to a place called Red Feather Lakes and did some fishing, and that was more nostalgic. That's where I grew up like, going. Oh, that's fun. So a couple of days that were fun you know, for kids riding around Rocky. We went to the YMCA, uh, like where all the young men like to go, mm-hmm. and young <laughs> children. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a song, the YMCA. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Young men. Oh, no, got it, got yeah. it. We can't sing it because we'd have to pay. Got it. Yeah, we don't <laughs> have that kind of money. So anyway, that's... that's. I was so intently listening <laughs> to your story. I was like... <laughs> okay. Excuse that me? There it is. There's, okay. That's what we did. YMCA. Fourth of July oh happened. That was, All right. that was fun. Nice. Well, I, while you guys were out gallivanting around the country, I was here, mm. and I caught up on I caught up on work. I... um. As you guys know, I think our listeners know too, is that I am um, part of Christ Community, but I also do a lot of counseling over at City Care, and so that was just just fun to be able to dedicate some time to that. We um, have not gone on a vacation yet, but we are going to South Carolina. Mm-hmm. My kids are super excited to fly because two years ago we had bought plane tickets and then COVID, oh. and so it was like, okay, they're going to expire. So we're going to South Carolina to see Ben's parents, who he hasn't he hasn't seen his parents for two years. Oh wow! Now, so well, that's yeah, going to be fun. We're doing that. Our kids are looking forward to fl- riding on an airplane, flying on an airplane. I Both? think you'd call it yeah. riding and flying. I yeah, I was, well, that's one thing I keep seeing headlines. <clears throat> excuse me, headlines about uh, people are kind of off the rails with air travel because I think because they were cooped up for so long mm-hmm. and now they have this kind of attitude problem maybe. And oh no, fortunately, don't say that. fortunately for our flight, we didn't experience much of that. But it seems like people have kind of forgot how to act oh, no. you know and well, so this you know be i'll have patient. to report back and i think i don't know like right now it's still mandated that you wear a mask mm-hmm. on a mm-hmm. plane which it, it's not comfortable mm-hmm. but i think i think the secret here to do- dodge that is just get a bag of peanuts yep and just eat it really slow yes. for the whole Snacks. flight it's just you're just breaking the law mm-hmm. and uh you're going against mm-hmm. federal law but n- I mean, it is just a weird thing. It's like, how do you, because you have the I flight know. attendants who are like trying to enforce it and people who are just kind of being rude about it. But then also there is the, you can yes. eat and that's okay. Well, thank okay, you because so. I'm traveling with a two-year-old. That mm-hmm. d- makes me feel <laughs> great. I don't know if I would, would be flying, except we had like a deadline for our tickets yeah. to use them before they expired. So mm. prayers. I will, I will say for me, I did experience a little of that just i guess shock back and it's probably for people that traveled a lot during covid so we did fly once like when all of the you know airplanes and all that kind of stuff were really limiting who could be on yeah and so they were like we'll only have like 50 percent full you'll never have to sit next to a person and so I, i flew on a southwest flight last last year and then we went to our national council a few weeks ago my wife and i and i kind of got spoiled you know because i was like no one what this middle seat no one should be able to sit in that middle yeah. seat and then all of a sudden they're oh, filling them up again an so example I, yeah. of the attitude so frequent flyers i'm sure you're like what what are you doing there's plenty yeah. of seats mm-hmm. around but now i think airlines are well and they're they're flying less up. planes and they're filling them to the max to save money so that way they don't have to keep as many planes in the air but so every flight that we were on was just super packed and cramped so yeah well I don't know. That's Prayers the, for me. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be great. Yeah, I'm I think sure everyone's fine. everyone's it's direct flights too. Getting over their oh, attitude yeah, that's, problems. That so. is a huge deal. <sighs> direct that, that flights with kids. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, it, it you know feels good to put these shoes back on. Oh yes. You know, I think that's what they, they're Hello, not as uncomfortable world. as Welcome the uh, are rumored back. to be. Uh, I'm glad you figured out your catchphrase. Uh, I'm back, Alex. We're still working on yours. Still working on. Uh, it. Did you okay. even say one? I, I think you were. I was so in shock. That I didn't even, <laughs> I wasn't even able to get out what I was going to try this week, so I'll have to try it next week. All right. We'll pray for you. Up next, we've got headlines. Our first headline comes from USA Today. It says, Degree Deodorant launches campaign set to endorse 14 NCAA standout athletes. 
is the is the nightmare over the 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 athletes can get paid now is that what's happening they are athletes can get paid so i think it was in june college that, athletes yeah, I should that the clarify. supreme court finally came out with a ruling on a case that they've been looking at for a while about the name image and likeness that mm-hmm. and that, so that's like the hashtag is nil um so athletes can now get paid for their name their image and their likeness and basically get sponsored at some level uh, now in college. And so I think it's going to be fascinating to see how this all plays out. And right now companies are kind of testing the water as our colleges uh, right now. And like you said, uh, we've, I think in Nebraska, we have such a radical fan base that uh, there's been debates out there, like what kind of colleges and obviously I'm a homer. So, but what kind of colleges are really going to benefit from this? Mm. And, mm-hmm. you know, Nebraska has been at the top of a lot of these lists because it's not going to probably be a lot of a ton of national brands uh, that are yeah. sponsoring these athletes. But it's like I know Runza came okay, out with a big thing, okay. you know, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and so it'll be kind of hometown brands. But this one that you brought up, Eric does have a Husker featured in it. Uh, the quarterback, Adrian Martinez, is one of those 14 uh, standout athletes, as well as um, – a, r- a random known fact as I was looking at those, a guy named Cam Mack. He's not a current basketball player at University of Nebraska. He transferred, but he's a point guard at some small college um, now. Uh, he's He's gone to a worse place, as I would consider it, but it'll be interesting. So does that mean that they're going to get onto a, d- a degree stick of deodorant? Oh, I, yeah, I don't know. There'll probably be some clever degree mm. types I don't know. of... Like, I'm going to get my degree. With yeah. degree. Stay fresh getting your degree with degree. Uh-huh. Or, I don't, <laughs> we I'd, should probably not be <laughs> commercial writers at this point. <laughs> I, but I like I like your thoughts there, Jess. <laughs> I think it's good. Uh, Does this mean they can get paid for, uh, like, their likeness, too? Like, when it's used in a video game yep. or things like okay. that? Okay. So, the, the game... NCAA basketball is, I mean, football is said to make its return. Mm-hmm. But that'll okay. be just fascinating to see. Like, I'm curious how much they're going to make. Yeah. Do does every athlete automatically because you're on a team and you can get subbed into? Or, uh, it'll be fascinating because I I know they do that with obviously professional athletes, right? And I I was always disappointed when I was younger because there was games that Michael Jordan just refused to let his name, image, and likeness be a part of, like Boundaries. NBA Jam, and so you. Mm. If you were a Bulls fan like I was and every other yes. kid. Yes. You were stuck yes. to Pippen and Rodman. Yeah, you, you had Pippen. <laughs> John Stockton. And, uh, no. Uh, well, maybe Stockton was. Not an NBA GM, yeah. I don't think. Yeah, oh, Stockton was. Teams. Yeah. I just think of like that dream team. Mm, yeah. And Horace Grant. Oh, yeah, Horace. Oh, yeah. But yep. as a kid, you were like, oh, why don't I get MJ? So it'll be interesting to see and how this plays out. you're still asking that question yeah. years still, later. Still asking. Mm-hmm. The last dance clarified a little of that for me, but. <laughs> I, I think what really begs to be, I, I think we have an opportunity here yeah, uh, as anybody? the uncomfortable <laughs> podcast. I think, you know, maybe this is the year we take our very, very huge budget, giant budget, um, as you can tell for marketing and advertising <laughs> and all of those kinds of things and sponsor a college athlete. Hey, that's not a bad idea. And so, uh-huh. so this undisclosed amount of money <laughs> will go to, uh, a college athlete. They could probably retire off it. We'll just say it's And we'll just much. use their face on our our cover art on iTunes and <laughs> <laughs> things like that. And yeah, maybe they'll, maybe like a little commercial. Oh, I love doing comfortable podcasts. Uh, who's a, who, who's a <laughs> Husker player that maybe he would accept this large? I think it'd be fun to have our, like our listeners tell mm. us oh, who. Okay. I was like it doesn't say, have to be a Husker. You definitely have a bias. It doesn't have to be a Husker. It could be J- yeah. Jess is a Jays fan. We didn't talk about the Jays We're news uh, today about how they cheated and they've got We're some not, restrictions on them. But no need to bring you don't the need ball. to bring negativity into this space right now. Okay, I'm so sorry. We're excited about our Def- sponsor. <laughs> deflating a basketball doesn't work as well. Yeah. For, in their <laughs> But I, yeah, so I, I think I it'd do be think fun. we need some opinions. Mm. I'd, I'd love to have some opinions, but they could maybe one advertising ploy is. 
a lot of athletes listen to music, right? Before mm. they, to pump them up before so they, they listen to us. <laughs> so how did you play so well in the game? What, you know, what's your secret? What are you listening to? Some, no, were you listening to Eminem? Were you listening to, you know, mm. eight mile, some of that? No. And like, no, the uncomfortable podcast. I was just what. listening to these three people <laughs> not disagree about anything and just <laughs> talk very calmly about these <laughs> subjects in culture and Christianity. And I just wanted to go out and smash some skulls. Yes. So. Amen. <laughs> I think we've got, so who, uh, and it doesn't have to be it could be a volleyball player yeah. we don't want to lead our audience to mm. whom it has to be but okay all right well i guess let could us it know be, could it be a wrestler like i don't know college I, ufc yeah i well i don't know <laughs> i don't know if ufc is a sanction i don't know NCAA i'm just throwing out all the all the think, things i can think I but if think we're, are we college, sticking right? to college we want to do a college well, yeah, athlete yeah, that's, that's the whole that's the, thing. that's the NCAA, okay yeah. i didn't know if we were you know doing uncomfortable you're just really oh, maybe if this works out we can branch okay, out okay, okay jess it. but we need to slow down okay we'll get there eventually i will <laughs> and, and if, i'll calm down and maybe <laughs> and it's first stand out i think anybody in college so if it's a band member mm. what know, if there was a that. parent listening to the uncomfortable podcast that has an athlete that's in college mm. could they nominate their i know a couple could they do nominate yeah. yeah doesn't have to be uh, to me it doesn't have to be d1 yeah it doesn't have to be okay okay so. i don't know it, is that all right i guess fair? we just gotta we gotta find out this is very official so i i'm sure <laughs> that we are all very concerned all right. about how official this is done mm-hmm. all right up next uh we're gonna be you know getting to the meat of this meal which uh this conversation this week is going to be about doubt so i hope nobody has any doubts about our ability to talk about doubt <laughs> So part of the vision for this podcast all along has obviously been to tackle uncomfortable topics and, you know, that intersection of culture and Christianity. But um, I think we've, we continue to try to do that. I think mm-hmm. the last series has shown that we're doing our best to uh, engage with these topics and talk through them and hear people's stories. And today we wanted to talk about doubt. Uh partially just because that is kind of a common thread through all of these things, uh, whether that is doubt in the existence of God or doubt in your faith, doubt, you know, doubt in scripture, different things like that. Uh, we hope that this, these topics can continue to forge our mission statement. And we are trying to, you know, we want to be accountable to that mm-hmm. as if nothing else, we're hoping that these conversations can help us and others be better disciples of Christ. And, you know, tackling topics like doubt is just part of that. Yeah, I think that's good. And I think for me, and we, we've probably said all this many times, but yeah, comfort is not the, like sometimes I think people, I remember early when we were beginning this, you know, people are like, we didn't hear you fighting about these things. Or even a lot of times we don't all agree on everything that's happening here. And sometimes people were disappointed that like Mm -hmm. we weren't yelling at each other and whatever, or like that doesn't, or I've heard people that one felt uncomfortable, you know? And, and really the object of that term isn't necessarily like because we're fighting and yelling, but the call of Christ is not comfort, you know, it's Mm. not towards. And so when we are growing in our faith, it's going to be an uncomfortable experience. And, and Jesus didn't prioritize comfort in our lives. Actually, we're told quite the opposite, that comfort isn't a thing that is, is to be looked for in life. If we follow Jesus, we're actually promised, uh, uncomfortable uh, moments. We're promised, you know, pain and trials and all of those types of things. And so I think it's good to remember as we wrestle through scripture, Christianity, all of this stuff. And then when you throw culture in it and how do we think as, as believers, it's important to remember this call isn't towards just comfort. And a lot of times when we have conversations with people, um, that think differently than us that act differently believe differently than us it's just it's uncomfortable and and wading through that water um is difficult at times but i'm i'm grateful also honestly for a lot of people don't know this but like we didn't just go start this random podcast you know we went through our elder board and had conversations with our our leadership team even that last series we did you know on sexuality we you know we are accountable to to people in these conversations they don't Mm -hmm. tell us what to say but 
they're supportive and have our backs in this and uh, not a lot of church, you know, at least friends that I have that work in, in uh, the church world are even able to have these conversations like in a feel safe having them in a closed office, let alone, you know, mm-hmm. on camera. And so uh, just grateful for the ability to, to be a part of that and, and a team that uh, has our, our backs as we wrestle mm-hmm. through a lot of difficult topics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of times there's an expectation for us to debate topics. But one thing that I think drew me when I joined the podcast was that we can dialogue about difficult things and it's a safe place to do that versus us debating and taking like to each taking our own corner and giving our point of view. I think that is a space that I want to be in where we're kind of talking about things that people are thinking about and maybe Mm -hmm. not saying out loud. And so, yeah, it's, we're still figuring it out too of like, where where we're coming from with these different topics like we're wrestling right along but i think just the fact that we can have conversations and yeah you're like you said alex they're not always loud and we're going at each other's throats but i think the depth of learning and growth that we're doing along with everybody that's listening like that's important yeah all right well let's talk about doubt definition of doubt is a feeling of uncertainty or lack of conviction are you sure that's what that means i don't know i might doubt that Uh, doubt that answer yeah it and i think doubt takes many forms but that's a pretty clear definition of it uh let's 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 just dive in yeah and I, i think part of why this conversation is important is um, you know, there's an organization called Barna, which does a lot of studies and, and really a, as a church here at Christ community, we, we listen to a lot of what they say and look at their research because they're one of the, the top notch research places, I think, uh, especially in, in the Americas around these things. And they, they've done tons of studies for why people are leaving the church and different demographics, mm-hmm. age, I mean, everything. And in a recent, you know, survey, they said one of the six reasons that young people are leaving the church is because it's unfriendly to doubters. And I think mm-hmm. that's, you know, really why this conversation is important, whether you're a young person that's listening and you're just passively listening and wondering, you found us on YouTube or whatever, uh, we want this to be a safe place for them. But also for, we have a lot of older listeners too that have been saved for a really long time, that have been a part of the church for a really long time. It's so fun to hear uh, from them. I was even sitting in a meeting a few weeks ago with somebody who had no clue would ever have listened to our podcast thanking me just for a new perspective uh, around some of the conversations we've had and uh, and vulnerability and willingness to to share some of that. And so I think it's an important place for us to even be in a space that's hopefully creating a safe spot for people that are wrestling through, uh, whether it's doubt in their salvation, doubt of God, doubt of God's goodness. I mean, doubt can come in so many forms and so probably can't fully uh, conquer it all today, but I think well, what great. are, what are some of those forms that we see even in maybe our own lives where we've struggled with doubt? Uh, maybe that, that can kind of help us get into this conversation a little bit, share some examples that might, um, help listeners, you know, even empathize with their own doubts, things like that. Who's going to go first? <laughs> who's going to go first? Who's yeah. going to well, open you, up with oh, the most you said vulnerability something first? So mm. yeah, that's all. That's all. I, I think recently, and I've talked about this a few times on the podcast. One of the one of the main ways that doubt creeps into my life is is doubting the goodness of God, like doubting God's plan, doubting all of that. And so, there's been several moments mm. in in my life where that um, the doubt of God's plan or God's goodness uh, has has happened. I know, uh, even looking when our daughter, when we were told she was deaf and that was something that was shocking when we've had miscarriage, things like that. Those are moments where instantly, um, even through my faith, I I began to like, man, is this, is this good? Is this right? If, if God is good. And I think that's the age old question. Then why would bad things happen? And and so you start Mm -hmm. to wrestle through those kinds of conversations. Anytime I have a funeral and I've done a, a couple recently, um, you know, you're, you're, smack in the middle no matter how many times i've walked through it logically um you're smack dab with like how did this happen Mm -hmm. like why 
why on this baby, why this kid, why this person that didn't deserve it. And, and so I think for me, a lot of those doubts can kind of creep in mm-hmm. around those types of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and really I think the doubt is not necessarily the existence of God for me, but it's the goodness of God or, or, or why he would allow things uh, to happen the way he does. So I think my, mine is a little bit in the, uh, in the same vein of, just God being a protector. We we read verses in the Bible where he's our defender and he he's our shield. And when we look at like what that means, even if you get into theology of he know he like he has a plan for our lives if we start going down that road. And then it changes. I think when you have ki- kids or you go through something difficult, it's like and it doesn't go the right way or someone dies or something bad happens it's like where were you Mm -hmm. like you said that you said you would do this and i believe in your word and what you tell me that you're going to do and where were you and i think that that's that's a place where i struggle and then also i'll say there's this um i think there's this pressure in christianity especially if you've if you've been a believer for a long time that there's an expectation and I it comes from different forms of we're expected to hear God's voice and we're expected to I ex, I at least feel like there's an expectation of what's he saying to you and where's he leading you and me to be walking at each step in that direction and I think sometimes it's hard like there are struggles that we go through in life where it's like I'm not I'm not hearing you right now like I have been a staff member at a church for almost 10 years and there have been moments in my life where I'm like where what are you saying like where where is your voice for me and so I think those are the two areas I guess most recently where if we're being vulnerable which I feel like Mm -hmm. hello here I am yeah those would be um two spaces for me yeah I think for me it's one of those things where the more the more you you have a desire to learn the more danger comes with that and the more risk you take um i know i know there was a couple years of my life where i just felt like i was losing people uh a lot of people like friends family and then it kind of you know reached a breaking point when my mom died and i think it was in that moment you know i it's not yeah it's you kind of doubt god's goodness sometimes because you're like well why why did this happen that sort of thing and and then at some point you're kind of for me at least i felt like well eric that's you're kind of being lazy a little bit just to go with that because that's you know that's expected like try to push past that but it it's one of those things where you realize that where you need faith and and for me faith was always talked about so loosely growing up in a church where that it was like an afterthought like well yeah you should th- we're all in agreement that we have faith because this is this is what we're about we're about you know about god and what he's doing and we need to proclaim his goodness and um but it's kind of that dark and light battle where if you don't if you don't have doubt, there's no room for faith. And I think the more that, you know, I, it's like, sometimes I feel like I'm just searching for proof that God doesn't exist because it would maybe be easier sometimes, you know, but you just, it, there's just so many things in there that say, no, they put, there's so many things in this world, so many things in my life, you know, that point to him. It's, it, you can't deny it. Um, but I think it was me coming to terms with the fact that doubt is normal and doubt can be good sometimes and doubt it without doubt, I wouldn't be able to explore my faith. And I think I remember growing up where my dad would, uh, he would counsel with people for all kinds of things as a pastor, you know, for whatever might be going on. And I remember one instance where it was with someone who, who was doubting their faith and I was thinking about that before we had this conversation today. And I was like that, it was so weird to me because in that moment, I just couldn't believe that this person wasn't believing in God. Like, how could you not believe in God? Like as a kid, Mm -hmm. it was so ingrained in me that I just couldn't even 
fathom that thought. I couldn't fathom the thought of life, not having life after death. Like those things were so ingrained in me. And then as I got older and you start to, uh, you know, you start to get a little more, um, beat up and you start to, Mm -hmm. you start to, you know, maybe dig into different things and try to learn the, understand the world better. And, and in that, you know, then doubt creeps in and, and I started to understand what that was, what that felt like, but then you also have all this guilt that comes from mm-hmm. it where you're just like, I'm not supposed to have these feelings, right? I'm not supposed to doubt. I'm not supposed to think this way. And I think that can do more damage than anything. I think that can damage our witness uh, as Christians just because so many times you'll hear people pray a prayer that's like the com- coming to faith or guiding someone in there they'll say beyond a shadow of doubt do you believe that god whatever and i think that's sometimes that that can almost be inappropriate or like being injustice to that that non-believer in that moment because i don't know that any of us always believe beyond a shadow of a doubt mm-hmm. and and i think for someone who's trying to come to faith that that's just, that's a really, that's a lot of buy-in right in that moment to go, you need to believe this beyond a shadow of a doubt. And so, I don't know. I think for me, that's that's the process I'm learning. And it's like, mm-hmm. as I try to witness to friends that are unbelievers or have those conversations, it's like, I need to be real and honest about myself and that, yeah, I doubt. But it's because of, it's because of my faith that that's the tool I use to. It's it's not that faith is the absence of doubt, right? Like I think mm-hmm. that's what people want to believe. I think doubt is so difficult because it affects us and it comes at us and it affects us from so many ways. So doubt can affect us spiritually, right? Mm-hmm. Like in our in our faith walk. But even in your story that you just told Eric, it's like mentally like that gives anxiety, like that creates I mean, you could even get depressed over those feelings and then Mm -hmm. it affects us physically, even in relationships with people and physically like how that plays out in our bodies. And so I think that's why it's such a heavy topic is because it it affects like our, it affects our whole body. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great point you bring up, Eric, too, that I I think we do oftentimes put doubt and faith as opposition. Mm -hmm. So they can't coexist together. Um, I think one of the easiest or, or one of the most revealing, you know, places I, I find a lot of like comfort or like, um, like me too, kind of in music. And there's an artist, uh, some probably wouldn't call him music, but his name is Andy Minio, and he has a song called Clarity, which is really about his journey of he says taking the cynic, I mean the scenic route in faith, and he has a line in there, uh, the opposite of faith ain't doubt. It's when I have it all figured out. And I think that's true. You know, mm-hmm. what when when and we are people that are seeking and God is revealing, but we're people seeking to have everything figured out. And we're even told by scripture uh, to be ready for to have answers to anything that people might ask, you know. Mm-hmm. So we're we're told and there's this whole apologetic movement in the church that we need to have answers uh, you know, for any questions that are asked uh, of us and so which I think is good in, in first right. Peter. <clears throat> but then it, it kind of turns us into to pious people. I, I think especially when we're not really confident in our answers, we become more pious uh, yeah. and we feel like we have to like have less humility and bow up and, and that's kind of a rigid don't ask more, don't dive deeper kind of stuff. And I remember working with students all the time and they would come to me with questions or come to their leaders with questions and their leaders, um, like the most dangerous thing you can do is act like you know the answer. You know, and I think a lot of times people act like they know the answer and when they haven't even like asked a lot of the questions or haven't done enough listening to, uh, to do that. I know for me, even after this last series uh, that we did on sexuality, I had a parent talk to me and say, you know, their kid thought, you know, that they couldn't love them, uh, anymore. They doubted their love because of them be going to, you know, a, a church, um, that might view marriage in a traditional way and to a parent that like telling your kid, your kid telling you that you don't love them is that's mm-hmm. disheartening. Yeah. But you know, my challenge to them was listen and, and let's talk about what like love is like, what does that even mean? Like mm-hmm. asking more questions and not just kind of 
getting offended, throwing up barriers and walls. I think that happens all the time. Like, oh, mm-hmm. you know, we're just dismissive. You, you just shouldn't doubt. Just believe, just have a little more faith. And I don't think that faith and doubt, uh, you know, they can coexist. They do coexist. I even would say they must coexist in this planet as we are finite beings trying to figure out an infinite God. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if we, God would no longer be God or worthy of worship or any of that if we had this fully solved. Right. And so. When I think faith is making a choice to believe where I think a lot of times people want to say, oh, you have faith. I wish I had faith. And it's like, well, that's, it's not just some magical thing you get. Uh, I mean, that you have to make a choice. And that's, and that's what I, I think going back to like har, har, hindering our witness is sometimes if people believe that, well, I don't, I don't fully believe, like, I think I believe there's a God, but I don't, so I'm not ready to be saved yet because, hmm. you know, and I think how sad that is to me, like to think that people might be apprehensive to ask Christ into their lives because they're like, I don't fully believe. And it's like, that's okay. We don't, we, we all struggle, not maybe not to the same degree, but we all struggle with our doubts and, Mm -hmm. and faith is this tool that we can use to navigate that and make the choice to believe. And I think even talking to kids who are struggling with that, you know, that's the kids are so, I mean, I feel like my kids are so much more savvy than I am and they can just, they just have a radar for, you know, bull crap pretty much. And they can Mm -hmm. see through that so quick. And it's just being honest with them. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. you know, cause I think it's nothing against my parents, but I do feel like sometimes when I came to them with those concerns, it was just, they would never ever admit to doubt whether they had it or not. And then I don't think that's the same today as it was then, but there was almost a, a way of learning faith that was, you can't admit doubt or that, you know, you're going to allow the devil in kind of thing, you know? Yeah, instantly you start to tell a kid all they've got to do is have the faith of a mustard seed and they can move mountains. And, uh, you know, a kid starts to close their eyes <laughs> and try to muster up and just enough. I, I, and I think that's the mystery of faith is it's not – it's something that's not just on our – on our own i think even Mm -hmm. the spirit is what helps continue to grow our faith and the spirit actually fills in some of the gaps when we don't even know what to pray the spirit groans with words that we can't understand that i think help fill in some of those those gaps between our faith and the reality of god but i think even that like i remember as a kid wrestling with that and then people like well a didn't lead to B, you know, the, I'm not seeing these results. That, well, I, yeah. Why aren't the Rockies moving to my backyard? God, you said I just had to have a little, mm-hmm. a little bit of faith, and I have to have more than a mustard seed. But then, it, then no, we don't talk about that. What does that actually mean? We just throw it out like, oh, that's cute. And we had a whole conversation about a lot of bad scriptures we do right. use that I think erode people's ability to have faith and have more doubt. Well, but I have the, I had a note written here on the mustard seed thing because I, I think that gets used a lot, and I. I've always looked at that differently and maybe you can, from a theological standpoint, can uh, graciously slap me if I'm wrong, but I, I've i always kind of read that differently. I, I felt like Jesus is saying that it's a lot and that people misinterpret that as it's easy, but he's saying, no, 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 you need to have um, this much faith. And I think sometimes mm. we struggle to even muster up a mustard seed amount of faith. And I, and I think for us as Americans and this, this very privileged life that we live almost no matter where you are, I mean, I know that people have struggles, but still there's safety nets. There's things that protect us. There are, you know, we don't, there's not many people who have to wonder where their next meal is coming from. Like we just don't, you know, you hear about miracles and things happening in other countries and it's, and it's probably because we just don't, really rely on faith that much, you know, faith in God to provide the next meal, faith in God to provide safety because we're taking that extra step to constantly wrap our children in bubble wrap and, and, you know, do all these other things because we want to be in control. And so it's like, I, to me, when I hear faith is a mustard seed, I look at that as like, do I even have that much? Like, that's a lot. And I need to, I need to ask for that. And if I could have that, then I could, you know, overcome some of this Mm -hmm. doubt that also makes me think though i mean just talking about like our culture wrapping 
being wrapped in bubble wrap. It's if if this if what Barna is saying is true, our culture, maybe the generations before us, and then our mm. culture is perpetuating absolutely a cycle where those people are not sharing. Mm. And so they're maybe living paycheck to paycheck or meal to meal and having this faith and we're not welcoming those people into our church or into our home or our community. And I think that it's out there, but I think to what you're saying, Eric, is there's, it's the cycle of we have maybe perpetuated something. We've obviously perpetuated something as a church if people that are doubting don't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so... Well, when doubts it's start to in creep there. into like eternity, you know, our, our, the security of our salvation, you, when, when our, especially when we have a, a thought process that if I have doubts, then, um, then I don't have assurance of faith. Mm -hmm. And if I ha don't have assurance of faith, oh no. Well, is that's this real? Scary. Is it, yeah. am I really am I really saved? Is this how's this going to affect mm -hmm. me eternally? And then you start getting motivated by fear. You know, so fear starts to to grip your your heart, and then faith and fear. I think a lot of times become opposites that don't really coexist very well together. And I think that's a a fear we, we could talk about fear for a long time that's mm -hmm. not total but fear is it's one of the vehicles that everybody uses to just dis, to dismantle faith or or fear is one of those things that that um that you it fills in a gap yeah of it, what you don't know yeah it mm -hmm. does and so I, I think it's one of those yeah one of those things that we use wrongly in a lot of places mm -hmm. so where are some ways that we feel maybe it's the church, maybe it's just religious people, maybe it's phrases that we've heard like, you shouldn't doubt, you must believe, you must trust, you should just have faith. Where, where, have these, where do you think these things are, are not helpful and they've maybe caused a problem or they've led people to deconstruct their faith or things like that because they weren't allowed to doubt or at least voice their concerns. I think, yeah, I think it's when you hear that rhetoric as a, as a child, whether it's from the church, whether that's from your parents, whether it's from wherever, and you don't see that and it's hypocrisy when you don't see that actually living up to it. You know, when you tell your kids, Hey, um, this is what faith looks like, but, but reality, you've never had to live a day by faith in your life. And, and I think a lot of kids are in, un, have, that I've had conversations with are so unimpressed by the anemic faith of their parents. And yet they've mm -hmm. been told not to doubt and, and they have, they're not doing anything righteous or, or not, not righteous. They're not doing anything revolutionary or, or then they look at scripture and, and, uh, and they are, faced with brashness and overconfidence and a lack of willingness to listen and it's just dismissed. I think that's uh, in a lot of conversations I've had, it's where things go south. I think, I mean, f for me personally, I grew up in a church that was very rigid and has a long history of, I mean, it, in its religion to have, like you're not questioning the theology. So then there's expectations in a church where I'm asking the question why and it's because it's been this way or because this is how we do it or don't question like you're not being submissive by answering that mm -hmm. and so we create I, I for me personally it just created this okay well I can't ask anything but how do I know like how do I know and so I grew up like just wondering like is this what Jesus is like is this what faith and religion is like where is the safe place and so for me i want i i was surprised coming to christ community we've been here about 13 years and um when mark does question mark and that's not, uh from stage and it was just it was shocking to me that somebody would get up because you can ask religious questions and to mm -hmm. me that was like you can question not that he's god but questioning god like sharing in a 
in a in a space in a church like that just really it surprised me because i did not grow up with that freedom and so i understand it's hard to it's hard to change your mindset Mm -hmm. when i think when we're not honest about different theological points of view which i think honestly mark does a great job of presenting both and that that this doesn't mean that somebody doesn't believe the bible there, I'd, I had conversations with people. I've, I have conversations with people, whether I was at this church or, or former church, where people are leaving a church. And a lot of times, you know, when someone leaves a church, first of all, if someone's having a conversation with me, thank you, <laughs> uh, because I, I think you're doing the mature thing to have mm. that conversation because a lot just don't. They just sneak out the back door. And so there are people asking questions. But a lot of times, honestly, what it ends up boiling down to isn't necessarily that a person can't, um, agree with a th- certain theological issue, whether it's men and women in ministry, whether it's worship styles, whatever that might look like. Ultimately, it's like the rabbit hole never stops. It's like, well, if I disagree, if I if this person comes up with a different interpretation or opinion on this issue that's secondary, then I don't believe their ability to interpret the Bible. So I start to have a lack of trust in any of their teaching. Mm-hmm. And but there's a lot of places that just present a Mm -hmm. side of a, of a story, whether I think a big one is old earth, young earth. That's, that's one of those things that I think there's room for, for thought and it's, it's a secondary issue and there's, there's room for, you know, debate on that kind of issue, but there's literally people that, um, they'll draw lines in a sand and doubt somebody's ability to exegete Jesus's, Hmm. uh, teachings based on one one thing and to be able to say yeah there's and this doesn't matter ultimately this doesn't matter Mm -hmm. in the scheme of of what it's trying to communicate but part of that goes i think that goes back into people's upbringings yeah Mm -hmm. and if they take if they take something at whole cloth and this is what they were taught and they were told not to doubt then there's no room for interpretation of the seven day creation there's no room to there's no room for that so if you if you even try to squeeze something in there to say well you know this was written for maybe for people of a different time to understand or anything like that then you're that's then they've already kind of one upped you because at yeah. that point it's like oh well you're doubting you're doubting the scripture you're doubting that this was inspired by god you're you're you know and so i think that's that angle that maybe it's not always it's not, I don't think it's a hateful thing. I don't think it's people trying to always power up, but it is, it goes back to fear and control. And it's one of those things where they're like, I, you're, you're presenting me with some new information that I'm not prepared to deal with because mm-hmm. if I do deal with it, I may have to confront some doubts that I have. And then by confronting these doubts, uh, then I may, you know, be, I'm not a super Christian anymore. And I'm not willing to admit that, so I'm just going to go ahead and let my let the fear take over and tell you you're wrong. Mm. And and I mean, we all do that in different, you know. And don't take that as whatever I believe makes me better or superior. Yeah. It's just we all do that in different ways at different times in our lives. And I think that's where the church could do so much better. Sometimes is just admitting our doubts and talking through our doubts and making the space for people to share their doubts. And there's going to be times where it doesn't make sense. And I mean, did you read the Bible? Like, that's a question I want to ask sometimes. It's like, how could you not doubt that? The stuff in there, I mean, you look at the people in the Bible. You uh, even, I was thinking of um, the royal officer's son. Like, you could tell that he believed Jesus was going to heal his son, but he also had this doubt at the same time in that mm. story. Or or even the fact that Mary's first response to the angel was how, not, you know, yippee, yay me. Like it was how, yeah. you know? And so it's like, there are so many examples of even people in the Bible having doubt. And then you read these other things of just wild things that are happening. Like, how could you... I mean, I'm sure there's a place for people who just believe it all whole cloth, but I just think when you read that, you go, oh, well, how did this actually play out? Because this sounds, you know, kind of unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And luckily we have songs like that really teach us, you know, about doubt, like Mary, did you know? <laughs> yeah. Did you know? Uh, and there is, there's room, our Christmas shoes. Mm-hmm. There's room for that mm-hmm. oh. inside of our, our faith. Mm-hmm. And I think some of our biblical heroes 
we we see them and maybe l- lament and we do a bad job i think of separating lamenting and doubt and all of this in the conversation like david clearly like he lamented deeply a, a lot of times we see that in scripture and, and if you read it at face value like this guy a man after god's own heart and this guy doesn't believe in god but there's over and over in psalms 42 he questions god like why have you forgotten me Mm -hmm. that that sounds like doubt like god where are you in the middle of Mm -hmm. of this and Mm -hmm. and it sounds more like an accusation than a question like god you have for like you've forgotten me um but i think it models honesty with god Mm -hmm. which i think a lot of times we feel like we if we feel like we can't there's shame in bringing our doubt to finite people, then we feel almost even more of a distance between us bringing our doubts to an infinite God, especially if we have a bad picture of God that his entire plan is to, to be dogmatic and judgy mm-hmm. and, and try to be a mean, angry, if you're so dumb kind of God, when I, I think that's very much hardly you know who God is but when we approach him and that's our view of who God is and that's our view because maybe that's we've seen a skewed version of a father or uh, of a church leader or whatever mm-hmm. then it, it it presses more into that but we have to talk about those things John the Baptist is another like literally the guy's life was set up to prepare the way for the savior of the world of mm-hmm. all people and the end of his life he's thrown in prison mm-hmm. Uh, about to be beheaded and he ended up being beheaded and he sent jesus are you he sent some guys to say to jesus are you the one to come or should we be looking for another yeah and jesus i think we even get to see how how god through jesus responds to our doubts in the moment like this of no i'm not tell john come on Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm peace out buddy you know but he's like no tell him tell him what you've seen and he speaks in john's language what did you come out to see a reed swayed by the wind and and tell them about the things that you're seeing and experiencing renew his faith in that and so he injects i I think faith and confidence in the middle of that doubt and doesn't just slap him around and say well (laughs) yeah Mm -hmm. i'll get a new guy so even even in those examples i could think for for me or even an unbeliever you hear that and go well well, even if, if these people, they had Jesus right there. The disciples had Jesus right there. They saw the miracles happen and they still doubted, you know, then what hope do I have to not have some form of doubt? Mm -hmm. I think it's part of having a relationship too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can hear all about, you can fantasize about love and like finding your person in this world and getting married and what that's going to look like. And then, you are with them and you're married and you're living life and you're like what is happening and i think we have this fantasy of like how faith and religion is going to play out because of maybe what we've been taught or our experiences Mm -hmm. and it's like okay what does having a relationship look like it's it's being able to ask why or ask a question and i feel like even the, the people the people that you have brought up in the bible I can think of other examples of like Mary and Martha saying, where were you? Like if you were here, Lazarus wouldn't have been dead. Mm -hmm. Or even, you know, the classic Doubting Thomas. It's like those scriptures to me say, okay, I can question you a little bit. And there have been times like driving home in my car, I've I've said, I I mean, I hope you're real. (laughs) Or, you know, just had moments like that in my life where it's like, this is what having a relationship with the Lord looks like, is having that freedom to say, you know, I don't have it all together, but I think there is that pressure to not say that and mm-hmm. to not be honest about that. And it's a it's a vulnerable space that we try to protect, you know, because we want to have it all together. Yeah, and I even think like the church, how, how it began was with a guy named Pete, Peter, the rock that, that God would build this church on. And, mm-hmm. you know, Jesus kindly comes and restores Peter at the, uh, I would say he might have doubted what Jesus's plan was because, and this is a brash guy that like cut a guy's ear off. He was he was confident. Yeah. But Jesus said, "Peace out." They threw that guy on a cross, and he didn't. No, I don't know him. You know, if he mm-hmm. was super confident in that, you know, he would have he would have been like, "Oh yeah, I know him," and you know what's going to happen? He's going to come down from here, and we're going to kick your butt. Yeah. 
but Jesus comes afterwards and he restores him mm-hmm. and and he loves him and he says, do you love me? <laughs> do you love me? And do you love me? You know, three times and feed my sheep. And, and so he just mm-hmm. comes in this kindness of like, Peter, for, I told you you were going to do it and then you did it. You're cut off. Mm-hmm. Done. I'm done with you. But he, I think, and I think that's the question often that, is being asked in, in our doubts. We're asking that to Jesus. And I think he asked that back to us. Do you love me? Do you love me? And, and, and understanding what that means. What does that love mm-hmm. mean? And how do we love in the middle of doubt? Mm. Yeah. There's a, there's a Richard Rohr quote, uh, that I, I think of a lot when it comes to faith and it, it's faith is patience with mystery. And, I just, I love that quote because it's, it's so short, but it just, it really Mm -hmm. kind of helps me come to terms with how do I navigate through doubt. And sometimes faith is just waiting because I think there are moments where no one's going to convince you otherwise of what, maybe where you've landed on something and you're struggling through a belief or something happened, like we mentioned earlier, something happened in your life and you just cannot find God in it and you don't feel he's there um, no matter what people tell you. And it's like faith is sometimes just having that patience and it's shrouded in mystery because you don't know when it's going to come, how it's going to come, what's going to, you know, how God might show up in your life next. Maybe it's five minutes, maybe it's 50 years, but it's that finding that time to wait and, and, and at least try to listen for his voice and try to, and try to have the conversations with him and, and pray. And I think, I think we haven't talked a lot about prayer, but I do think at least for uh, in my life. And I think in other, others would agree that that's sometimes that's where you leave too much space for doubt is when your prayer life isn't it's very strong, you know, like mm-hmm. when you're not, when you're not talking to God and you're not, having that conversation about what's going on and you leave these, you kind of leave those openings in your armor. And, uh, I mean, I, it sound it's sometimes, sometimes to me when people will use prayer as the answer to everything, I, I almost brush it off. Like, okay, is there any, even any value in this word anymore? We use it to, you know, for everything. But I do think that it's just something so simple and it's becomes a, a very important discipline for us to, connect to yeah I, I think man when you're doubting um i think we have two postures one can be run away mm-hmm. or one can be run toward and, and i think i have a friend who you know in the military and had to be at sea and all that kind of, and and even in a when distance when conversation when you haven't been with someone or talked to them or had had that to reassure you, mm. then that doubt's going to creep in more and more. But if we run toward God, I think he delights in it. If we run toward scripture, what he's said in scripture, the truths that he, that are undeniable that are in scripture, like you said, praying and not just, oftentimes I think prayer is me talking at God, mm. monologue, but listening, you know, to God, even in, through those silent moments. I think running toward God with our doubts is the answer, but a lot of times we feel like we have to run away from him. Mm-hmm. And that's scary. I think there's like the fight or flight, but then there's also like the freeze where we feel stuck and it's like, I don't have the energy to run towards God. I think there's this beautiful part about him where he pursues us mm. and it's okay for us to sit where we're at or to be frozen and feel like I can't move forward, I can't move backward, but just knowing that and faith maybe that mystery that we're talking about of just that he do he does pursue us and can meet mm-hmm. us where we're at and community mm-hmm. i think is also yeah. like real genuine we can wrestle through this kind of stuff together and so you don't have to carry uh the burden that really can be heavy of doubt uh, mm-hmm. alone but you can do it with other people and sometimes the thing i need in the middle of doubt isn't an answer mm-hmm. from somebody it's I'm praying for you. Mm-hmm. I pray that you'd have some, you know, sweet time with Jesus. And there's moments where like, I, I realize that and my wife will <laughs> kind of say, you, you need to be alone or, or whatever and spend time 
you know, with, with the Lord and, and he's not always just dropping, Oh, here's the answer to your mm-hmm. question. But there's something about that proximity and that relationship that starts to bring reassurance mm-hmm. despite mm-hmm. my doubts. Yeah. Well, and I, th- I think as leaders in the church struggle with doubt, it's so important for them to share that. And I mean, even in your position, Alex, I think being able to share the fact that you have doubt to someone, I mean, a lot of times there is this unspoken hierarchy that happens and what for better or for worse, but mm-hmm. you know, just Where it's like, we're allowed to, but Alex, yeah, you, like you, yeah, you know what I mean? Guy. It's kind of, yeah. yeah like you can't have any doubts, but I do think that in other people's doubt hearing that, you know, this person that they would imagine should have it together or has the answers doesn't always have the answers. And I, there is this honesty that hopefully we spoke about at the beginning of this, you know, discussion, but that that's kind of where we're, what we're trying to dip our toes into, or at least that's what we're trying to chase after with these conversations is find mm-hmm. those honest places mm-hmm. where people can be vulnerable and also feel safe to share those doubts. And, and hopefully we can, you know, we're not going to figure it all out in an hour or whatever, but we're going to maybe get a little bit closer to understanding one another. Um, and, you know, hearing God's voice, whatever that may be, mm-hmm. you know, maybe not audible, but some, some way finding peace in all of this. That's good. That's good. So, and I think that's why we love hearing from you, the listener, mm-hmm. uh, about what are these things. So much of what we talk about is is suggested by people that we run across or send us emails. Um, and so as we're heading into this next venture, uh, almost into episode 100, we're almost yeah, we're there, which close. is crazy, a little over two years. Yeah, this isn't about serving us, but it's about, hey, what are these things? What are the spaces that you're wrestling through these these conversations of culture and Christianity? Mm-hmm. Who are people that you know? How, how how can we deal with this? And we'd love love to hear from you. And I know you say that at the end of every show, hey, no, but just, we really just do. Feel, feel free <laughs> no, to steal it from me. I, no, I no, think sometimes people think that yeah. that's a rhetoric, you know, yeah. that we just mm-hmm. say, but we really do. And we yes. have heard from I have I haven't said that line in so long. I don't even know if I can do it correctly. <laughs> yeah, so I would out. just want to say that, yeah, if you if you want to hear from us or you have something you want to talk about, like do send us an email. Like, I hope that doesn't mm-hmm. sound rehearsed. That's like, we would, we would be happy to even read it uh, on air and, sh- you know, discuss it right here. Mm-hmm. So, and we sit at this table, it's like two, six foot tables. Mm-hmm. And I just always think like, there's room at our table. Yeah. Like there's room. Come. It's like and that audio adrenaline song. Yeah. Is- <laughs> it's a big, big house. We've got room at our table. You can, not, you can not sit not with unlimited. us. You can no, come and no, sit with us. Not. That's true. Uh, no, but thank you for for you guys have this conversation and like just taking the time to do this. And thanks for everyone who's listening and takes the time out of their busy days. And also, just there's a million choices out there right now for podcasts and things like that. So choosing us, uh, I mean, that means a lot. And uh, hopefully, we can continue to get better at this and have tougher conversations and uh, do it justice Uh, but if you have any questions or concerns you'd like to reach out to us do email us at podcast at cccomaha.org or you can uh, reach out to us on social media that's at cccomaha we'd love to hear from you until next time we'll talk to you then Mm -hmm.